There's a lively conversation going on in missiological circles that takes us beyond questions of insider movements and contextualization, the framing of the gospel for different religions and cultures, into questions that relate to dual religious identity and what does it mean to be a Christ follower within other religious traditions. In this episode of the podcast, my guest is Darren Dirksen. He is the author of a brand new book, Christ Followers and Other Religions, The Global Witness of Insider Movements. And he and I will uh, unpack all of the issues related to this book. Well, this is the podcast for Multi-Faith Matters. I'm the host, John Moorhead. I'm privileged today to have, as a returning guest, because he's a glutton for punishment, Darren Dirksen. And uh, I'm going to read uh, Darren's bio off the back of his current book that we're going to be talking about here today. Darren Dirksen is Associate Professor of Intercultural and Religious Studies at Fresno Pacific University. He is co-author with William Durness of Seeking Church from uh, InterVarsity Press in 2019, and author of Ecclesial Identities in Multi-Faith Contexts by Whip and Stock from 2015. And today we're going to be talking about this book here. For those of you watching the YouTube version, Christ Followers in Other Religions, The Global Witness of Insider Movements, a brand new book. Darren, welcome back to the podcast. Thanks, John. Great to be here. And uh, love just by the way, love the work that you are doing via this podcast, and uh, great to be back. Well, it's good to have you here. Before you've been on the podcast, before talking about you helped us uh, understand uh, Sikhism, and you've had some conversations with our our Hindu friend Fred Stella about Hindu Christian dialogue. And today we're going to do something different as we talk about this new book. And you and I were talking before we recorded. I kind of stumbled upon. We're going to at the end of our conversation talk about a conference coming up in March of 2023, and you're one of the presenters in this, but I'm intrigued by this uh, concept of Christ followers in other religious traditions. Who, who is the audience for this book? I, I notice in the, the introduction, you're, you're, you're talking about, you know, you've, you've got notes for the academic, but you want to make it accessible. Who did you have in mind? Yeah, I, I have in mind probably persons like my my students that I teach at Fresno Pacific University. So, you know, undergrads, um, persons, and and I think largely a Christian audience. So, uh, and persons who are probably at least a little bit familiar with some of the missions discussions that are going on, um, and maybe people who have done things like the perspectives course in that's really popular in some churches. Uh, or maybe have done a little bit of short-term missions and just have had a taste of some of this kind of work um, or cross-cultural work, um, you know, all the way up to to persons who you know are, are perhaps more uh, scholars in this area. So I'm trying to make it a broader audience um, and and include a number of people into it, uh, but largely a Christian audience, a Western Christian audience, and I think I've I've got a particular sensitivity to some of the reservations and questions that um, evangelicals, you know, which I have kind of a, a foot in in that camp, um, they, uh, some of the things that they might be concerned about or wondering about. Well, obviously, there are things in this book that are, are that will make the, uh, my assumption is the average church-going, comfortable American evangelical uneasy, and we'll unpack some of some of that and why that is, and, and does it need to be the case, and are we maybe holding ourselves back uh, in some instances, but uh, uh, for those who don't have a background in missiology and intercultural studies, can you uh, define and unpack for, for listeners and viewers some of the basic concepts like contextualization and insider movements and these kinds of things? Yeah, yeah, well, maybe if I could um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about insider movements, okay. and if I could do it by just maybe some brief background as to how I got interested in this. Um, I remember back in 2000 or 2001, I was teaching at a Bible college in India, and I read a book uh, by a, uh, a missionary by the, uh, by the name of Herbert Hofer. It was called Churchless Christianity. 
Mm. And that caught my eye, my eye, you know, how can you have a Christianity that's churchless? And uh, so, you know, books do that sometimes. They draw you in by the title. And uh, I and I read it, and it was a study that was done in the 1970s, actually. And it's been replicated since of, of Hindus around Chennai in South India, Madras, Chennai. And uh, a large kind of quantitative study that was paralleled then with, with some interviews um, and it found that a large, that quite a percentage of, of persons in that city were, were hit, they would call themselves Hindu, but in terms of practice, devotion and such, they were followers of Christ and they had different ways of expressing that. Um, the big key thing was they just didn't want to take baptism, which for those of those that are familiar with sort of the Indian context, baptism is become a particularly strong marker for, for religious identity in that context. And, and sometimes it's even legally the mark that you have now shifted from one community to another. So for that reason and others, there was this whole group of people and that opened my eye to, wow, that's, that's interesting. And um, years later, I, I was then working in Delhi and I came to uh, know about some groups of these Christ followers in Hindu and Sikh groups and uh, was able to get to know them and study and understand a little bit more about their beliefs. And from there, it really blossomed out. It came to know that there are groups, individuals and groups uh, like this in many other contexts, in Hindu contexts, in Muslim, in Buddhist, uh, Native American, and, and many others. Um, one of the characteristics that would probably be similar across the board is that these are generally people and sometimes groups, maybe even larger movements, that want to follow Jesus. They, they prioritize the Bible and, um, and they are very much following Jesus as they are reading and understanding uh, their readings of the Bible. They worship Jesus um, in, in, in groups. And, um, but, but they don't want to turn their back on their community and their family. And they want to stay part of that. And they want to stay identified with their religious group and even continuing to practice some of those practices. But there's tension. And in every context, they're trying to figure that out. What practices can we do and still stay followers, uh, faithful followers of Jesus? And so that's a dialogue that's ongoing. But they're living in that tension. And, and they are trying for the sake of witness to stay a part of their groups, but also stay followers of, of Jesus. Now, these aren't often really large groups, um, but, but they're there and they're, they're individuals and others that are working this out. So I found this really interesting um, as a way of, of saying, hey, there's alternative ways of, of living out our Christ following life in a multi-religious society. And so that's, that's kind of what's animated and motivated my study along the way. Um, I'll talk briefly, contextualization is uh, a term that missions, missionaries and mission persons have used to talk about how do we adapt the Christian faith across cultures? So how can we use and, and adapt music and other practices um, into the worship service? Um, and into our lives. And so that it's not just a Western faith, but it's a faith that looks and feels and is every bit, whatever the context is, but it's a Christ following faith. And so that's this, that's, that's often the context or the, um, the concept of, of contextualization. Yeah, I think that'll be helpful for folks, again, who don't have that missiological background there as they read these things in, in the book. And if they come up again in our conversation, you've got this fascinating term in your book here, uh, alternative missiological imaginaries. Can you, what, what is that? I love it. We, we love these really complex terms, <laughs> don't we, John? I mean, we love just like, let's people say, why do you have to make it so complicated? Right, right. Yeah. And um, well, in, let me take it in, in a kind of a backward order. So okay. starting off with imaginary, Charles Taylor, who's a sociologist, social science um, scholar, uses this term imaginary. And um, he uses it in a way to say, hey, every society has kind of unwritten assumptions about the way society works. It could be, so, he calls it, he talks particularly about social imaginary. 
So in the United States and Western countries, we kind of have assumptions about the way things should work. You know, the way I as an individual am kind of a, you know, a strong, independent person who can make my own decisions. Well, that's part of an imaginary way of being in the world that not everyone around the world would share. It's it's particular to my context. And so he he doesn't use the word in a way of saying it's a made up. It's an imagination. It's an imaginary. It's something that sort of informs the way I live life. And he, he unpacks it in other ways, but that's kind of basically it. So I, I kind of take that and I want to work it backwards. So I talk about a missiological imaginary. That is that when we become followers of Christ and we're learning about what this means, it shapes the way we live our lives. Um, and we call that mission. How do I live out my life as a follower of Christ in the everyday? Um, and how do I make that know it's like you know i i have a different way of living now and i show that through my words and my actions well that's that's mission and uh, a missiological imaginary would be how do i reorient my life in 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 now according to christ um and so in his mission and his desire and then lastly i talk about alternatives so alternative missiological imaginaries and what i'm saying is you know too often we in the West, I'll just put myself in that category, we sort of assume that there's just one way of doing it. You read the Bible and, you know, that means I've got to live my life and be a witness or be an evangelist or whatever in a particular way. Um, and missions should look in a certain direction, should look a certain way. But there's alternative ways that God might shape somebody to be a witness. Now, some he may call to stay a part of their Muslim context and live out their Christ following life in that context. Maybe some others won't feel that call and they'll convert out of Islam and become Christian and they'll live their witness in a different way. And there's certainly lots of people that have done that. And we, you know, we, we affirm the, the, the brave choices that they make, um, but there's alternative ways of doing it. There's not just one way of living out your life in a particular context. There's alternative ways of being a witness for Christ. So that's, in a nutshell, or maybe a big nutshell, kind of what that <laughs> term is referring to. Well, again, it's a great concept, and I hope we can get there, at least take some initial steps. But of course, uh, the realities uh, of the world are very messy. And many times, especially, I'll, I'll speak for you know American evangelicals, we don't like messiness. We like black and white, and we like things to fit in a particular way. But it seems to me that we need to expand our minds about what might be possible. There are certain concepts, if, for example, in religious studies, um, there's recognition that the word religion, it's not so easy to define. There's, there's a lot of disagreement among in the scholarly community about what how you define religion. Culture, the relationship between religion and culture. I, I'm of the opinion that uh, religion is a part of culture and you can't just pull it out like, Here, here's the religion piece, let's take that out and it's separate from culture. Uh, there are hybrid religious identities or, or dual religious belongings, these kinds of things. Can you talk to why, why those are problematic and how we might work through rethinking those in light of having this imaginary? Yeah, no, that's a great point. Um, I remember in um, some Bible class that I was in one time, somebody put up a, a PowerPoint or a, or a, 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 a figure that sort of showed a, a graph of society and it was like a pie chart, you know, and, and then there was the different pieces of the pie. And, and so you had, uh, you know, you had work life, you had school, you had these things. And one of the pieces of the pie was the religion piece. And, um, you know, and it made sense, I guess, for that particular person's point. But I thought as I've reflected on that image so many times afterwards, I've realized yeah, how Western that is. We think that religion is just one little piece of the pie. Now, as Christians, we would say, well, and it should affect the rest of the pieces. But we still think that there are these really clear marks between these different things. And, um, and that is a very Western understanding of religion. You know, in so many other contexts, religion yeah, it's it is definable, but it's not a it's not a solid line. It's more like a dotted line that really influences and in, is influenced by, like you said, culture and, and so many other politics, other aspects of society. 
Um, and so that's the way they live with this idea called religion. And so I think that's the first thing we need to be careful of is when we say, hey, you, you can only be part of one religion. Uh, in our minds, you know, we're just thinking of this one piece of pie that, you know, it, it could only occupy that have this one particular identity. Um, well, for others, that, that idea of religion, it also incorporates family, it incorporates community, it incorporates their national identity. Um, and they may prioritize certain things over and against others. See, this is the other thing about religion, right? I mean, someone who calls themselves Christian, what do they mean by that? You know, it, it might mean that, hey, I, I converted and I put Jesus at first and I read my Bible every day. Others, they may use that word as to say, well, I was born into this country and I was baptized when I was a kid. And it's just kind of part of my identity. Um, and it's more of a social, national, family identity, or some mix of those, right? And so we have to realize that when somebody calls themselves by some term religion, well, that, that's that got multiple meanings. And again, it's not this one dot solid line that says this is what this is. It, it, it blends into numerous other things. So that's where I think, you know, for someone to call themselves a, a Muslim follower of Christ or a Buddhist follower of Christ, that may strike some of us as pretty weird, but that's because we've got this really strong bounded understanding of what that means. For them, that might mean my national family identity. And yeah, some of the way I see the world is Buddhist, but it's now being reshaped and prioritized by Christ. And still kind of weird for us, but for them, it makes a lot more sense because of that, that way of understanding religion. Yeah, it, it seems to me, one of the things that has always struck me as curious over the years is that there's not more interaction and dialogue between theologians and missiologists. Mm -hmm. And to gauge in generalities here, I mean, missiology tends to be in the trenches. Uh, it's dealing with the messy reality, the lived real realities of religion within culture. Uh, there I am, you know, again, parsing the two separately there. But and in theology, it's like it's this it's a historical system. It's a system of belief, you know, in the West and this kind of a thing. Um, do you see any potential uh, or, or need, in addition to potential, to, to bring missiologists and theologians into conversation, not only for understanding, but perhaps to, to help us move in the West beyond some of the, these problematic categories that we're stuck in that separate the, the more abstract theology from lived religion of missiology? Yeah, no, that's a great point. And I think there's a lot of people that are that are a lot, but many that are trying to do that and, and seeing that theology is, is at its essence, a lived thing. We do theology, you know, I mean, Paul in the New Testament, he's writing theology, but what's he doing? He's addressing specific things. We call it like theology on the run, uh, you know, and it's, it's, it's being generated by the questions uh, that are happening at the moment in a context. And that's, mis that's what's happening in mission all the time, right? The, the gospel is going into new contexts and, and theology is bubbling up there because the gospel is interacting with culture and situations and questions. And now it may not get written as a systematic, you know, book uh, and, and published in some of our, you know, major publishers in that sort of way, but there's theology happening. Um, and so I think to really prioritize and, and listen to that carefully is, is a great thing to do because there's a lot we can learn. Um, and so that's, and that's one of the things I'm trying to do in this book, particularly in the, in the, 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 um, the last part of it is just to say, hey, when we listen to some of these people, what are some new insights we get about salvation, or conversion, or the nature of family? Um, and, and just, they're not trying to systematize it, but what if we listen to it and then what might God's spirit challenge us with so I, I think it's a great things to check out there yeah well let, let's go there for a little bit to to move it from the more abstract and theoretical to the the, the again there's lived realities can you share us a story or two from some of the folks that you have talked to that we might reflect on yeah sure i think of uh one by the name of vj who uh again in india and um, he lives in, in an area that is predominantly Hindu, uh, like many parts. And you know his his story 
is not unlike many, kind of in a, in a more of this, this first generation where he uh, originally converted out of Hinduism. He was from a higher caste family. He originally converted to Christianity through the influence of some Christian friends. Um, and he actually then got involved with ministry and kind of full-time ministry and so forth and, and found that really fulfilling, except for he always had this real strong heart for his own family and his own people. And, and he was frustrated with the ways that what he was being taught and the way he was being discipled wasn't really answering his own community's questions. They weren't open to listening to him. Uh, they had these, these negative assumptions about Christianity um, and, and the way it was practiced and um, numerous things there. So through a long process, he, he eventually uh, decides to, to change course. And um, through the influence of some others that he had met who were Hindu followers of Christ, he, he kind of found this alternative way that for him made sense. And it was a big sacrifice because he had to basically uh, give up his, his position, which was sort of a paid full-time position. Um, and he had to find a new job within the community. And he actually went through a whole process uh, that they kind of came up with of, in a sense, re-entering the Hindu community. And there's this little ceremony that they actually went. Uh, he brought by his family and his friends. He says, hey, I, I want to say, you know what, I, I made some missteps in my life. And I want to reaffirm that I'm part of this community now. But I'm doing so as a follower of Jesus. And he really highlighted that. Hmm. His father said, hey, I accept you no matter what. You know, you're a part of us now. Um, and so it was this wonderful doorway and window into back into his community where he could be organically be a part and share his faith again. So he, he does that, continues to share about Jesus, has these gatherings occasionally. Um, and uh, he's... You know, one of the things he's done to get at your question is he has kind of reconsidered what does it mean to, to baptize? What does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? Well, in his context, there's, a, there's actually a ceremony when somebody, a Hindu, wants to really show their devotion to maybe a guru and, and to, to one of the, the deities. They, they go through this particular ceremony. It's kind of a, a, a name ceremony where they, they're, they're, they're even given a new name. And they go through this, this ceremony that includes water. And so he's sort of adopted that, the same language. But he said, hey, our guru is now Jesus. And we're going to follow him and his scriptures. And, uh, and, and so they don't call it baptism. But that's what it is. And that's how he understands it. And that's the association they make when they read the New Testament. This is what we're doing. Um, and so, but it's, it's, it's got this richness to it that comes from the culture that says, hey, we are following not just this human guru, but we're following Jesus and, and what he represents for us. And that speaks to his community in a real special way. Well, I'm assuming that uh, when these kinds of stories come about, that, that there are challenges and it's not always well received, not only with, within the local Christian community, but also in whatever, whether it's Hinduism, Muslim, this kind of thing, are there are continual tensions that have to be navigated? Oh, certainly. Yeah. I mean, he, you know, he found, um, you know, he, he gets challenged from both sides. Um, and this isn't un uncommon that certainly any Christians that might be in the person's um, sphere don't often understand this. And so he, you know, he got ostracized by certainly his his former um, group that he was with, Christian group, um, and, and others. And then sometimes, not so much in his case, but sometimes even some of the, the Hindus or, or in other cases, Muslims or others, kind of, they look at it and they say, nah, that's, we're not sure about that, you know? Um, another guy that I know in uh, in another country who's, who's Muslim and follower of Christ uh, you know, says, yeah, the, the Muslims around us, they generally will accept us, but they say, yeah, you're, you're Muslim, but you're a different kind of Muslim. Um, and now that's not always, in his case, that works. There's, there's some flexibility there. In other places, that's not as acceptable. So it differs from place to place, how they, can they live in sort of this tension, this space of tension, um, with pressures from both sides. 
Uh, I mentioned before we started recording the conversation uh, years ago in seminary, uh, Terry Muck was one of my professors and he was teaching, I can't remember if he called it world religions, which itself is a problematic term, a contested term in religious studies. Um, but he was noting how there have been very little success mission-wise in certain parts of the world, like Asia and so on. And so he posed a question. We had to write this short essay. Uh, I think we had like an hour and he just kind of sprung this on us there. And he, he said, do we have to convert people to a Western monotheistic, a form of ethical monotheism first and then preach the gospel? Do we just preach the gospel within their cultural forms and it takes on kind of its own thing? Um, so that was a question that was asked that I've had the back of my mind for about 20 years now. Is this question still being reflected on? Is it is it starting to get more on the missiological radar? What would you say is the current state of affairs? Yeah, no, that's a huge, uh, a great question. I, I remember one time in a, in a college, um, when I was in college, I was part of a Christian group and being taught how to do evangelism. You know, I remember one person saying, hey, when we do our evangelism, we, we first got to convince people about the bad news, you know, and then we can tell them the good news, right? And this idea that we've got to make sure they understand, in this case, what sin is, right? Bad news, the consequences of it. Um, and because there had been this cultural shift, even in our own, about what is sin and who cares and, you know, that that all that relativism that we're familiar with. Um, but, yeah, I mean, I, I've often thought about that, how we have our own interpretation of those kinds of concepts. What, is it, what does it mean to be in, in sin? Or, and so when we reflect and we would listen to some of these contexts, we, we hear some challenges to that. They don't usually take the form of challenge, but they just take the form of their own way of understanding it. What does it mean? And we could broaden the concept. What does it mean to, to not be um, flourishing like God would want us to? What are the barriers? What are the parts of brokenness that have come into our lives and my society and my community? We'll call that sin. You know, and then and then what's the good news to that? What does the gospel say to that? You know, and it may not be framed in terms of sin that keeps me from eternal life in heaven. Um, I mean, that may be a piece of it, expressed it in some sort of more contextual way, but there may be other things that are more forefront. You know, some of the issues they might they have with with their own context and relationships, um, relation to the land, relation to their family, relation to ancestors, you know, I mean, whatever the issues are that are challenging to them, that are the, they think are the broke parts of brokenness, that if these were corrected, we would have a flourishing life. Life would look better. Creation would look better. How does the gospel speak to that? Um, those, you know, those are those, those, again, those local theology, parts of local theology that I think we've got to listen to it. Yeah, I think we're doing better at at trying to hear that. Um, and I think there's much more we can do. Yeah, I remember years ago doing an interview on a blog I was doing when I was a seminary student and I talked to Robert Schreider on his book, Constructing Local Theologies. And I was just struck by the the need to, to move beyond these massive meta theologies to, to theology on the local level. Do you think that's still a significant thing that we need to interact with? Yeah, definitely. Um, and I think it goes both ways. There, I've heard some local, I, I think there are those that have been working at that, and there's some really rich local theology that is being, has been done, is being done, has been published, still much more that could and should be done there. Um, and, and then I've also even heard some from some of those contexts saying, hey, and let's make sure we don't get the pendulum too far. We're part of something called the church. And, and, you know, we have, uh, we should have relationship across cult cultures and contexts. So let's celebrate the differences. Let's make sure that, you know, the vestiges of colonialism that are still there don't continue to push down the local voice. Um, and let's celebrate that. But at the same time, let's make sure we're creating bridges and say, hey, and we've got the commonality. We are brothers and sisters in Christ. And that has got some significance for now and on into eternity. So I, I hear both of those, but certainly still trying to celebrate and, and lift up local voices. 
Do you think that a part of what holds us back from considering this alternative missiological imaginary uh, is that there's so much, you know, we, we like to, we, we as human beings uh, like to live with settled realities, right? We, we understand the way the world works and we tend to get, hang around those who see the world the way that we do. And we really, we'll, we'll change concepts somewhat, but wholesale, large scale changes tend to make us uncomfortable. This topic that you're writing about in this book has implications for all kinds of assumptions, the nature of the church, uh, in-group versus out-group, you know, did, it, it, the, the way we tend to think about it in American evangelicalism is we're the church, a bounded set, and we proclaim, and then we pull them into our bounded set, and there's a clear cut, you know, there's a rejection of the past and incorporation into church culture. I think maybe even under rethinking what the gospel means in its original historical narrative context and how does that apply uh, in terms of salvific questions, all kinds of possibilities are opened up. And I don't know that that makes us feel real comfortable, but at the same time, can't we view it in terms of this imaginary as a positive way to, to rethink things as, in terms of possibilities? I, I think so. And I think what we can do is, is reflect, and I do a little bit of this in the book, is, is even reflect on the nature of the Holy Spirit. Uh, because if we think of the Holy Spirit as that part of the Trinity that not only is involved in my life, to sanctify me and maybe give me gifts, but also is that part of, of God that's, that's hovering and, and is part of wider, the wider creation, drawing the creation and people to Christ, ultimately. Um, what does that mean? How is the Holy Spirit at work in some of these different places already? And how is the Holy Spirit shaping them and their imaginaries? Um, because, and then, then my task is to go in and listen, uh, to say, hey, this, there's, there's something here where God might be at work um, in some really powerful ways. And there's brokenness and, and we don't, you know, and, and we try to figure it out. We don't always get it right. Um, that's there in every situation, but the spirit is there. And God's got a, he's got a, you know, he, 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 more than me, more than you, John, more than anybody wants his church to flourish, you know, wants his creation to flourish. And he's working by his spirit to, to redeem, to renew. So going in with that real positive mindset, you know, rather than saying, oh, there's, there's, there's danger here and there's evil. Well, yes, there is, but there's goodness too. You know, where might that be? Where, where, where might God already be at work? Um, I think that's a corrective that maybe a lot of us can use. It, it seems to me that the elephant in the room, and I've heard this so much over the years, is, is syncretism. Um, again, I go back to Terry Mock. He said, you know, in, in theology, syncretism is a dirty word. But in religious studies, and to a certain extent in missiology, syncretism happens to modify a curtain, you know, a favorite bumper sticker that people have. Um, <laughs> it, it's just out there. But again, that goes to our assumptions about religion, there being a pure thing of religion, uh, that there isn't some kind of overlap between traditions historically and, and culturally over their development and so on. That's not to say that there aren't legitimate concerns. Can you speak to the fears we have of syncretism and how we might positively navigate that. Yeah, no, I, I think you, you summed it up really well that, uh, you know, I, and I generally try to avoid the term only because of the connotations. You know, sometimes you, you know, as a writer or whatever, you, you kind of just weigh it up. It's like, okay, do I, do I fight this battle and try and, and, and use this term and make it mean what I want it to mean? Or is it, is it just a losing battle? It's, it's got too much baggage. And that's one of those where I, I think in Christian circles, it's just got a lot of baggage, you know, for Christians, what it means is that there's a mixing that's happening. That's gone over, that's gone over the line. Um, and, and that mixing has made it such that Christianity is no longer identifiable as Christian. Uh, the distinctives of Christianity is, have been lost. And certainly that's that's a danger. Uh, there, there's that. But what I think of as syncretism is more of a process. And, and you could be anywhere along a, a continuum in that process. Um, now, if we could think of syncretism like that, then I think it's a real positive thing. And like you said, that's usually what religious studies scholars and others think of. Because 
there's no expression of faith that isn't somehow mixed in with a little bit of culture, you know, and, and, and numerous other things. There's no pure expression of faith, at least on this side of the eschaton, you know, we, we're always mixing and building and that's, that's a positive. And yes, it can also cause so much deviation. And there's those, there's examples of that church history movements that have just gone way far and are no longer identified as, or really even identify themselves as, as Orthodox Christian. Um, but we sometimes get so concerned about policing that line that we lose sight of, you know, God's the one that's ultimately in charge. And my blinders may, may keep me from seeing the positives. And, and I, I only want to see the negatives and, and try and police that. I don't think we're supposed to be missiological policemen. Uh, I think we're supposed to be joining what God is doing. Yeah, well, it's, it's a thorny topic that will continue to be, but hopefully through these kinds of conversations and more explorations, uh, we can work through in a positive way. Now, you are going to be uh, making a presentation as a part of a conference coming up. Uh, we're recording this in the end of November 2022. The conference is March of 2023 in Pasadena, but uh, limited tickets available for on-site, but it will be available via Zoom. Um, can you talk a little bit about that, the, the conference called Beyond Contextualization? Yeah, um, exciting um, opportunity, a panel. I'm just, pr I'm privileged to join two amazing scholars, Dr. King Sung Tan and Dr. Harold Netlin, who have done uh, wonderful work around uh, the theologies of religion, some of these topics that we've just been talking about here. Um, and then I'll be, I'll be joining them. Dr. King Sung Tan has done some recent work around some of this and calls it in religionization. Um, but it's basically uh, a panel and, and some, some discussion groups that are going to be, uh, you know, as they say, rethinking religious and cultural boundaries and um, just unpacking a lot of what we've just talked about here. So, yeah, I'm really looking forward to it and invite people to come. Yeah, folks can look in the program notes and we'll have a link to the event, right? It's, it's still in the, the planning process. So there's not much there, but there's enough to whet the appetite and folks can uh, secure their tickets early. Um, one final question for you, Darren, what would you like viewers and listeners to take away a few items that would comprise an initial alternative missiological imaginary? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's hard. Cause it, it, it's dependent upon your, your context. So I, you know, your podcast probably goes out internationally. So I wouldn't want to speak too broadly. <laughs> um, I'll, I'll reframe it to just say, I think what it is, is we need to be careful and, and check our assumptions about what it means to follow Christ in a multi-religious context. Um, I, I go to kind of a more of an evangelical church that's pretty contemporary. I like it. It fits me. It's, it's, and I, I'm not apologetic about that. Um, but I would be really hesitant to bring somebody from a very different religious background into that context. I, I think the gap would just be enormous for them. Um, not that, not insurmountable. Um, I think there has to be alternative ways to, 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 to model uh, what it looks like for them to follow Christ and their, their community, even if that's here in the United States. And uh, whether that, what that means to worship Jesus, what it means to follow him on a daily basis, how they uh, interact with some of their own religious traditions, um, and, and so I think for me, what this really challenges me to do is to make sure I don't put my way of following Christ at the center. Um, and when I'm hopefully witnessing and sharing with others about Christ, I'm doing that. I can, I'm doing that from my own perspective. That's all I can do. But hopefully can point them to other, other options or I can open up the possibility that, hey, you don't have to follow Christ exactly like I do on Sunday morning. You know, maybe there's other ways and we can explore a little bit of that together. Fantastic. Well, hopefully that'll give folks a little bit uh, to be thinking about until they rush out to Amazon or the favorite, favorite uh, bookseller and pick up a copy of Christ Followers and Other Religions, the Global Witness of Insider Movements, movements by my frequent guest, Darren Dirksen. Darren, thank you so much. Thanks, John. Always a pleasure. Appreciate yeah, it. It's great. I look forward to, to hearing what you have to say at uh, the conference uh, in March. It'll be fantastic. Great. Looking forward to it.
Well, I'd like to thank my uh, viewers and listeners until the next episode of the Multi-Faith Matters podcast.